Good evening, everyone. This is Donna from the LaSalle Public Library welcoming you to tonight's virtual program on Monarch Migration. Before we begin, just call your attention with my usual commercial to the screen with two upcoming programs next week, Tuesday, May 18th at six o'clock. Natalie Martin, naturalist of U of I Extension Office, will be presenting Grow Your Own Appetizer Garden. These are things that you will be planting as soon as we get some good weather in Illinois and uh, growing and with recipes of things you could be making with appetizers. So we're going through all the courses of a meal. And um, if you missed beverages, that is on our website on a recording. Next week, Natalie will be back with appetizers. And then upcoming is Dickie Chappelle Under Fire. That is on uh, May 25th. John Garofolo, who wrote the biography about Dickie's life, uh, will be here as our presenter. He is with the Wisconsin Historical Society. And um, Wisconsin is the uh, home of uh, Dickie Chappelle. She grew up in Milwaukee. So I hope you can join us for that. It's an outstanding program. Dickie Chappelle was the first woman uh, journalist to be killed in action with the Marines on her fourth tour of Vietnam in the war zone um, in 1965. It's quite a story. She was quite a remarkable person. And I hope you can join us for that special program. And now I will stop sharing my screen and turn this over to Lisa Sons. Hi, Lisa, and uh, she's going to tell us everything we want to know about the monarchs coming back to our area. Welcome. Thank you, Donna. Hi, everyone. Let me get on to the program. Okay. So temperatures have been a little unpredictable, to say the least, here in Illinois, and I know we're experiencing some cold weather this week, but hopefully here at the end of May into early June, we will start seeing the return of the monarch butterfly. I know I've already started to notice um, some of the smaller butterflies and skippers in the area. And I know that the monarchs will be coming back here as soon, soon as well. So let me... I wonder why it's not letting me move it. Hmm. One second, bear with me. I'll just go this route then. There we go. Okay, so the monarch butterfly is a milkweed butterfly. So this means that it, its whole life cycle basically revolves around different species of milkweed. And here in Illinois, we have a handful of different native species of milkweed, the most common being common milkweed. That's seriously its name and ones that we can typically find in our local garden centers would be the common milkweed, sometimes the swamp milkweed, and then of course the butterfly milkweed. You can order the other varieties online. You also just want to make sure that they are local distributors. You wouldn't want to order from Florida to plant in Illinois. And Basically their life cycle, they look for milkweed plants to lay their eggs. And then that egg will hatch into a pupae and then into the larvae. And they depend on the milkweed leaves as a host plant. So that is the only plant that they will eat at that larval stage. Their life cycle is completed within 30 to 40 days. Eggs take three to six days to hatch. Now I have a picture of a monarch butterfly egg here in the right center. 
and you'll see I have a picture of a pencil and pencil lead. And yes, I did hold my pencil actually up to the screen when I was putting this PowerPoint together, but a monarch egg is as tiny as the tip of that pencil lead. And I am overjoyed when I go out to my little area of prairie here at home and I find monarch eggs on the leaves. And usually I'm one of those people that takes a picture of it like a proud grandparent or something and posts it on Facebook. So three to six days to, to hatch. And then caterpillars are full grown within nine to 14 days after hatching. So they are not going to look as big as what we typically see by the time we do see them on the leaves. And the different periods between molting when they're shedding their skin, almost similar to a snake, and growing larger each time from the amount of milkweed that they are eating is called an instar. Those are the levels. So now we'll get into metamorphosis. So the process of transformation from an immature form to an adult form in two or more distinct stages. Metamorphosis typically involves amphibians like toads and frogs and insects such as your butterfly, your monarch butterfly that we're looking at here. And we've already discussed the egg hatching the larvae growing those different instar periods as they get larger and molt. Now we're going to talk about the true change. So in the upper left-hand corner, you can see that the monarch butterfly or monarch caterpillar at this stage is already hanging and forming what we call the J formation. So this is what they naturally know how to do when it's time to change. And as this J progresses, they will molt again. And as they molt, it creates this hard shell, this chrysalis. And the monarch chrysalis, I think, is one of the most beautiful of all the butterflies or Lepidoptera, even of the moths or the cocoons, but the chrysalis is just a beautiful jade green and it has these gold dots all along the top and the bottom. Now, the caterpillar itself typically does not form the chrysalis on a milkweed plant. They will usually actually go anywhere for up to 30 to 40 feet away from the host plant. And this is basically as a, an instinct to protect themselves. So to seek some type of shelter or something to cover them as they're changing inside of this chrysalis. And the change is called pupation. So they are going to pupate and change from this caterpillar that you see in the left to the butterfly you see that is already developed down here to the right. So the chewing parts of the caterpillar that used to chew and process the milkweed leaf have now changed over to an entirely different structure for the mouth. It is now changed into what's called a proboscis. And a proboscis is, is like a straw, it's a tube structure, and this is what helps them feed from the nectar in plants. So now they change from eating the green material in plants to liquid, to the nectar provided by flowers. This stage usually takes nine to 14 days. So there have been times where I've been lucky enough to catch a glimpse of a chrysalis. I have butterfly milkweed, swamp milkweed, and common milkweed right now at home. And I've had a chance to catch the chrysalis. And then life happens, I get sidetracked. And by the time I come back, they've already emerged and flown off. So blink and you'll miss it kind of thing if you get busy and sidetracked like I do. 
Now you'll also notice that the coloration has changed. So they've gone from the black, yellow, and white stripes to the beautiful orange and black with veining throughout their wings. Instead of crawling, they're now gonna fly. All right, let's go to the next slide. So there are no visible signs to signal the emergence of the butterfly. The chrysalis will suddenly just crack open and out comes the monarch. I know some friends of mine have just happened upon the moment where this is happening and this bottom left hand picture is the picture that they usually will will get where the butterfly is almost as most vulnerable because it has to kind of hang out and let itself dry and you know pump what it needs to throughout its wings before it can take off so this is when it's most vulnerable especially to to birds one of the birds that occur here in Illinois, especially in our prairies is the Eastern Bluebird. And the Monarch Butterfly is one of its favorite little treats. Now, interestingly enough, the caterpillar is not very pleasant to eat. So a lot of times birds will pluck the Monarch caterpillar and then spit it right out. It's kind of gross. Okay, so this can usually take an hour after emerging from the chrysalis. And then they're immediately hungry, of course. That was a lot of energy spent through pupation and all they wanna do is eat. So this is why you see a lot of butterflies that have chrysalis timed with different plant species. So they have that instant grocery store around them or drive through whatever you want to call it, where they can find those flowers and drink that nectar that they need in order to survive now as the adult stage, which is the butterfly. Five to seven days after emerging, it's also old enough to mate and the life cycle will begin anew. So male versus female. In the fall here in Illinois, I know a couple um, of the natural resource coordinators for the state, we actually tag monarch butterflies and we have to one, make sure that we write down if it's male or female, two, put the little sticker, little tag on it, record the number for the tag, and three, make sure we're not tagging a lookalike like a viceroy and we'll actually discuss that here in a second. So the male monarch butterflies have two black dots on their bottom wings. These dots are absent from a female. So you can see in the top picture, those two black dots, those are actually areas where they release pheromones. Pheromones are what insects pick up to attract a mate. Um, all mammals, we have pheromones. If we didn't wear deodorant, everyone could smell our pheromones. So these are things that, that attract their mate. So this is why the male has those black spots and the female does not. The male is also slightly larger than the female. And you'll see down here below, maybe some of you have already witnessed this camping, hiking, or just walking you know, in your own yard after a rain you'll see butterflies puddling. They'll be grouping together around a wet spot in the ground. That is basically their habit of absorbing minerals and nutrients from that water, that water that's sitting in that soil. And actually they'll also be attracted to other liquids Maybe you've had a butterfly land on your arm after a hot, sweaty day or yard work. So they're attracted to the sweat and the minerals in your sweat. The same thing with urine. So if you're out camping, 
and you happen to urinate in the soil or on the path or what have you, butterflies will eventually most likely gap there as well. Um, mainly the males will puddle because it can help with, with mating and fertilization for new eggs. Females will also have larger veining on their wings. So if you look at the top picture, you can see how thin the veins or the lines are on the male monarch. And then you look at the bottom hand holding the butterfly and you can see how thick those lines are in comparison. Okay, mimicry. The ability to appear to be or to imitate something other than what you really are. So the viceroy butterfly is pictured on the right and you can see they're almost identical and animals evolve to do this as an adaptation mainly for protection. So a lot of birds learn to spit that attractive monarch caterpillar and monarch butterfly back out of their mouths, even though they've taken a nibble because they don't taste very good because they have been living off of the milkweed plant. That milkweed actually gives them that toxicity in their body towards other predators. So the viceroy is believed to mimic the monarch to allow it that protection. But you'll notice on the viceroy, I had the arrow pointing to it all along the bottom wings here, you'll see what looks like a, a V. I know you have to take some creative liberties with that, but think V for viceroy. And you look over here to the left on this male monarch, there is no V, no V whatsoever. And then also another comparison, you look at the dots along the edge of the viceroy, they're evenly spaced and they're larger. And you look over at the monarch and there's twice if not three times as many dots and it's heavy all along those margins. Caterpillars look quite different. Now this is another, oops, went too far. This is another mimic to deter predators. So the viceroy caterpillar on the right doesn't look very good. If I was a bird, I would think that that was another bird's doo-doo. And the, the butterfly, this species does that on purpose. They wanna look like that so nothing picks them up or thinks that they are food. Same as with the monarch caterpillar, those bright flashy colors is kind of like a warning symbol. Like if we found a bottle that had two crossbones and a skull, that's a warning signal to us not to drink that. That's gross, that's poison. The same with that yellow, black and white stripes on the monarch. Okay, another mimic, the queen butterfly. So again, we have the monarch on the left. We have the queen on the right. So both species will actually feed on milkweed plants. But if you look at the queen, you can see it has larger white dots to yellow dots and stripes as in comparison to the monarch. Also, you're not likely to see as many queen in our areas, um, they have a smaller range than the monarch. The monarch butterfly can be found throughout North America and you know, different species will, will migrate up the West Coast, then kind of the, the Midwest, the Mississippi Flyway, so to speak, and then the East Coast from Florida. And some will, will stay permanently in places like Texas, Florida, and sometimes even resident populations in Mexico. Queen butterflies are slightly smaller in size and they are more of a rusty red orange as opposed to a yellow orange color that the monarch has. And their caterpillars, again, mimicry to protect themselves from being eaten. 
the queen has very thick black lines with yellow dots instead of stripes. Okay, now let's get into migration. So one of the magical things about the monarch butterfly is that it's the only butterfly that migrates. And say you saw a monarch butterfly last September, probably on its way out heading south. And that is not the same butterfly that you're gonna see returning here at the end of May into June, depending on the weather that is going to be the grandchild or the great grandchild of that original butterfly you saw last fall. So it shows some of the migration areas here in North America. And you're gonna see that we fall in this summer breeding area. That's why we see them in summer, typically late May through September, sometimes into the middle of October, depending on the temperatures and then they will return back to their southern nesting and breeding grounds for the winter in Mexico. Okay, some things that the monarch has encountered within the past 20 plus years. And this is something now that besides tagging monarchs for Monarch Watch, which is an organization that tracks the population of monarchs migrating through the different areas of North America and putting trends together if different weather patterns are affecting them or habitat loss, things like pesticides or insecticides or not enough host plants, milkweeds along the way. You can also, or at least last time I did this was about 10 years ago, through a, a university in Georgia, I'd have to look it up who it was exactly. You can actually test for this specific parasite when you're tagging the butterflies. They were just clear little stickers about the size of a nickel and you just gently roll it on the wing and it'll pick up the, the spores, but they're not really spores. It's more or less, um, this specific type of, of parasite. It's a protozoan parasite, but you send that in and they will measure what was picked up on the sticker. And it gives data of how infected that individual was. And then they base that on statistics for that population that came through the area. Now, this particular parasite and an adult can carry it specifically on the abdomen and not necessarily know that it's carrying it. And then when the female deposits the egg, that parasite, since it is a parasite, it's parasitic, attaches to that egg as it's laid. And then as that egg hatches, it attaches to the larvae and each molt, it's still with that larvae. Then when the larvae go to pupate in the chrysalis, you see this occurring. So this middle picture here, it's, it's necrosis. So it basically feeds on the larvae inside of the chrysalis. And the larvae is never able to fully turn in to that adult butterfly. And even if they do get somewhat to that point, as seen by this bottom picture, they won't survive. They, they will be, um, they won't be formed enough to feed themselves or fly or, or even function. Now I have found chrysalis before that looked completely healthy in the beginning. And then seven days later, they are completely black. So I knew that that one wasn't gonna to survive to adulthood and it was already attacked by this parasite. And please don't ask me to say the name of that parasite. We just always call it OE and it's even OE in the literature when we would test for um, this specific parasite on the adult butterflies. 
So go, go for it if you want to try that Latin up there. <laughs> Okay, some other predators and some other statistics. So fewer than one out of every 10 eggs laid by a female monarch will survive to become an adult butterfly. This is another one of the reasons why you hear so much about monarch butterflies in the news and on Facebook and through different nature center programs or state park programs or DNR initiatives, Wildlife Federation initiatives, um, Nature Conservancy, you name it, is because they are in trouble. They are in trouble because of the parasites. You, you also think about the perils that they have to encounter through migration. They are coming from Mexico all the way up and some of them don't just say, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hang out here in Illinois. No, they keep going. And we'll head up to Wisconsin, Minnesota, Canada. And you can only imagine, you know, a thunderstorm can blow them off course. They could be susceptible to predators if they are in that storm and then they have to dry their wings before they can set flight again. Winds can throw them off course. Vehicles birds. You know, there's different perils that, that are out there in different obstacles on their migration. I just think it's amazing that such a small and delicate insect can migrate those distances um, just to procreate and, and keep their species going. And then they have to face things like these parasites or natural enemies like the praying mantis to the right. So in the past, um, I've noticed in our prairie garden here at home, praying mantid egg cases. And if they are next to a milkweed, they haven't hatched yet, I will move, I'll cut that, that stem and I will move that to another area of the garden. Praying mantis can also actually be a predator to hummingbirds. So if you see a praying mantid nesting case or any praying mantid hanging out by your hummingbird feeders, you might want to think of relocating that as well. Another sign that they are infected with a pathogen is if the caterpillars themselves stop eating and hang limp from a host plant. This is basically another way of saying that they are dying and they can't process food. So that those are just some of the things that can occur. Um, some things that you can do if you want to plant more milkweed in your yard or maybe get your neighbors involved and, and do a whole patch of, of native plants, including milkweed to help monarchs on their migration. And maybe you want to share it with your family so they can also watch that life cycle. Go to monarchwatch.org. They have an excellent website and they even have a store on the website where you can buy your butterfly nets you can buy your butterfly cages to, to watch them as they grow and hang from the chrysalis. And then you can buy potted milkweed so the larvae can eat and then hang. Um, and then you can release them. You can buy your tags from them. Maybe you wanna do something as an educational program with a group you work for. You can also buy the tags from Monarch Watch. They give interactive maps and timelines so you can watch the migration in progress with different data that they type in. It can show you where they're at right now in the United States. Goes over monarch biology and tips for butterfly gardening. So different plants that are, that are high in nectar I know here, like I said, I already have the milkweed and then I plant things like bee balm, monarda. I have um, 
Oh, what else do I got going that they like? Oh, asters, New England aster. They like that as well. So anything that is a native source of nectar. So not necessarily something that's exotic or non-native because it's good to remember that native animals that have evolved here in North America, even in different areas of the US have evolved with those plants that started here, um, especially in our area where we're kind of like between, I think we're around zone six, zone seven, right here. So native plants are best. Always remember that when you want to plan a garden to help different native wildlife. Speaking of help, build a butterfly habitat or garden. And it doesn't have to be something that's extensive or large. I'm not talking about, you know, designated one whole spot of your yard or an acre. You can actually do this as container gardens too with, with different pots um, on your patio. Plant seasonal host plants. So don't forget different types of milkweeds. So you can start easy with the butterfly milkweed and the common milkweed, which you can find in almost every single garden center out there. I was just at a garden center over in Princeton today um, looking for different native cultivars and they did have common milkweed and the butterfly milkweed. Also online, you can find um, Prairie Moon Nursery and Ion Exchange nursery. Those are two that are situated in Minnesota and on the border of Illinois and Iowa. And they have um, native sources very close to our own. And I know there's a lot of different plant sales that happen right here in Illinois. If you go online and do a Google search that sell different native plants and plant plugs this time of year into early summer. Don't forget to think about the seasons. So if you are going to plan an extensive butterfly habitat or garden, think about how you're gonna lay it out and the different plants you're gonna need for different bloom times. So a lot of your asters aren't gonna start blooming until later in July, if not August, because they're some of the last blooms of the year. So you're gonna need something else in that time frame of June and July. So it could be something like your salvia, um, larkspur, delphiniums, your bee balm will bloom somewhat in late June and July. So just think about the different bloom times so it's gonna have a constant nectar source. Water or mineral source. Now, I've seen some um, gardens at different nature centers where they just simply make a depressed, like a little concave dip in their butterfly garden, fill it with a little bit or line it with a little bit of sand, and then make sure it always has water or a water source. Um, it can even fill up on its own with rainwater, and this will help with the puddling. Now, it doesn't wanna be very deep, because keep in mind, these are, these are butterflies. They're not gonna have long legs like a great blue heron. Okay, some fun facts. Only the fourth generation migrates. Monarch caterpillars and butterflies are poisonous due to the chemical toxin in milkweed, the same plant they eat as a host plant. Possibly named for being the largest of North American butterflies or for the Prince of Orange, King William. Called the Wanderer butterfly in Australia. Frass is the term given to caterpillar poop. I thought that was pretty cool. Each of the five molts or stages a caterpillar goes through are called instars. We mentioned that earlier. Monarch caterpillars gain 2,700 times their original weight. They need a lot of energy to go through metamorphosis to finish those last stages. A monarch caterpillar can eat a whole milkweed leaf in less than four minutes. This is something good to know because when 
a previous nature center that I worked at, we had kept a monarch cage. So when we found larvae, caterpillars, outside in our butterfly garden, we would snip the milkweed leaves and bring them in so different visitors that came in could see the life stages as they progressed. I felt like every day I was going out and collecting a bushel more of milkweed leaves. So keep that in mind. Don't think that you're gonna be able to rear 20 monarch caterpillars and keep them going. It's gonna be constant milkweed source if you try to do something on that large of a scale. So start small if you're starting as a beginner. Okay, some of my references, some um, searches that you can do also online. And usually when I am doing research for a program or a video or something that I'm writing, I, I just start typing in different keywords. I'm sure all of us do that. You just want to make sure, I, I lean more towards the scientific sites because then they're gonna have their own reference, their own research pages. And I'll, I'll lean more towards um, government sites. I know with my birding programs, I lean a lot towards Cornell Ornithology and the Audubon because they're, they're the leading um, organizations in the field. Okay, so to learn more about all the programs offered to the University of Illinois Extension, please visit the Extension website listed here. To learn more about the Master Gardener program or how to become a volunteer, please visit that same website. Or if you want to learn more about becoming a master naturalist or even a master gardener, I'm a master naturalist. You can follow that same website. And also gives you information about our region for master naturalists with the U of I Extension Office and that's Bureau LaSalle, Marshall and Putnam unit. And at this time I will Open it up to questions if anyone has any questions. I think you have several comments and questions in the chat. Um, did you want to go there and just kind of scroll down? Yeah, let's see if I'm able to. There it is. Let's see. Okay. So this one is from Craig. Oh, hi, Craig. Craig's one of our volunteers at the park. <laughs> what are the yellow dots made from? So different pigments on different animals can come from different things. So I'm a bird person. So in regards with like birds, like the rosy get spoonbill, that is a bird I encountered a lot when I worked in Florida their pink feathers come from their diet that's heavy in crustaceans like shrimp. With the butterflies, I am not certain. I'd have to look that up myself, but I can tell you that they're yellow dots. Um, if you look on the, the last slide here, this is a magnified wing of a monarch butterfly. And it almost looks like feathers. It's not feathers, these are called scales. And the scales on the insect are, are very soft. That's why you have to be very gentle when you are tagging a monarch butterfly so you don't tear their wing or you, you don't rub off any of their scales because that can affect their flight. But the yellow, I don't know. That would be an awesome thing to ask Siri or Google. You stumped me on the first question, Craig. All right, let's see. We'll also try to find out for you. And if we come up with an answer, we'll run it by Lisa and then we'll post it if we're right. Okay. Let's see. It's not letting me scroll down. Okay. 
So most birds are fond of anything that is flying, especially if they have a heavy insect diet. And the birds that are living um, within our prairies, like the meadowlark and the eastern bluebird, yeah, they're, they're going to catch insects for their diets, whether it's picking them on the ground like the meadowlark or picking them from the air like the eastern bluebird. But remember, once they get a bite, they're like, yuck, that's disgusting, and they'll spit it back out. But this has already damaged the monarch. It's, it's a good protection device in theory, but if it's an adult butterfly and they've already gotten half of their wing or half their abdomen chomped off, they're, they're pretty much done. Um, why tag a monarch? So the monarchs that are leaving us here in Illinois in early fall, we tag them because they will fly down to areas like Louisiana, Texas, Arkansas, and they will stop and lay an egg and then they die. That egg hatches then, pupates, goes through metamorphosis, and that adult makes the final trip to Mexico. Then that adult overwinters, hangs out, has a party in Mexico, lays an egg coming back again, like Texas or, or still in Mexico, hatches, pupates, that adult makes the way back and then will lay an egg. So that's why we're seeing the fourth generation come back. Hopefully I explained that okay. Well, Lisa, let me just continue on with the question there. So when does that tag ever get seen again if the butterfly dies and doesn't return? That is a good question. Thank you, Donna. So the tag is seen by folks like us just out hiking. Um, I've only had, and I have tagged butterflies since 2001. I've probably tagged them 10 times. There's a couple of years in there, a handful of years I didn't. And I've only had one, one tag found and reported. And um, it was from a batch that I had tagged when I worked in Cedar Rapids, Iowa at the Nature Center. And I had left there in 2003 to move back to Illinois. And I got a call later that year from my old supervisor saying that Monarch Watch had contacted the Nature Center and that one of our tags reported was found. And it was found by a farmer in Louisiana. And he was just walking his field and he found the butterfly and he thought it was strange because it had a white dot on it. And when he looked closer, it was the sticker. And the sticker gives information of how to report it. That is totally awesome. Wow. So that is really something. One sticker that's ever been reported on my end that I've done. <laughs> But still, the chance of it being found by somebody who is, you know, this wasn't necessarily something that he was focused on in life and uh, that he, he reported it. That's just wonderful. Okay, I have had tropical, common, and swamp milkweed and butterfly milkweed in my gardens. Huh. So yes, interesting that you say that, Craig, about the trop, oh, sorry, I should read that for everybody. I have had tropical common and swamp milkweed and butterfly milkweed in my family's gardens. The caterpillars only favor tropical milkweed, but the caterpillars won't feed normally on my common milkweed, swamp, and butterfly weed. Recently, I found out experts are saying not to allow tropical milkweed to grow since it can keep the mo monarch butterflies longer. So I haven't read that, but I have read in other reports of, for instance, how to build a butterfly garden, what types of plants to utilize, not to use tropical milkweed. So tropical milkweed isn't a native plant here. It is something that can be found like say in Florida where there is a resident population. So that would be interesting to see 
further about that article, if you want to, this is from Craig, if you want to email me and let me know where you found that article to see if there's something, some compound found in the leaves and possibly the nectar um, that provide them more nutrition than our native species. Because I know that my butterfly milkweed is preferred more than my common milkweed here at home. So that, that is interesting. That's something I'll have to read up on myself. I think wasps are attacking my caterpillars. Any suggestions? <sighs> Unfortunately, I mean, it's kind of like a predator prey world. I, I don't know how you could protect them from the wasps. Maybe if, if, if they're still at the caterpillar stage, maybe you could get the fine mesh netting to place over the plants um, to protect them during this stage. But this will be have, have to be something that you monitor on a daily basis. So you make sure you don't miss them hatching out of the chrysalis so they can then fly off and get nectar. Um, so you got kind of like that seven to 14 day mark where they're in that chrysalis. But that, that would be the only thing I can think of from protecting them from, from different wasps. Do you encourage average people to tag? When I've done tagging programs in the past with the public, I first show them how I do it. And then I bring people out of the audience to help me that feel comfortable. So you, you have to have a very light and delicate hand and you have to have quick reflexes. Um, and it is kind of nerve wracking, I'm not gonna lie because every year that I do it, I myself am scared because you have to hold them just right by, you basically put your index finger and your middle finger right by their legs, by their abdomen or above their abdomen by the wings. And once they relax, they'll flatten out their wings. And then you take that sticker and you just gently press it on their back forewing, just gently press it on. And it, it, it has strong adhesive, so it'll stick. And then you let them go just by opening up your fingers. Um, but again, I've, I've done this type of tagging program with Girl Scouts. So little girls can handle it. Um, I think anyone can handle it. Just taking your time, knowing what you're doing. You may or may not have a casualty. I, I will be honest, I've had a casualty before. So it's, it's one of those things um, that you just have to make that decision on your own. But I know that Monarch Watch as well as all the different agencies together that are trying to protect this species because it is such an integral part of our ecosystem. I'm more than happy to have citizen scientists. And I know that Monarch Watch also has steps. And I know you can also find YouTube videos that help coach you along as well. And if I'm tagging this year, I can always reach out to Donna and, and let her know and then she can contact those that attended this program if you want to come out and watch or even help me. We certainly um, can do that. So let's put that on the books and you let us know if you go ahead with that this year, Lisa, and, okay. and we'll get the information out to everyone. Have you seen the bright orange colored milkweed beetles that feed on the leaves? I have. Yeah. Yeah. I've had those beetles here too. Um, when are you showing us how couldn't handle casualties? I know it, that's a hard one. <laughs> um, usually I tag depending on if I have staff to watch the visitor center and I can get away from the visitor center or I do it on my day off 
and usually tagging, I always shoot for the third to last weekend in September, but I watch the weather. So if we're gonna have a really hot summer, I'm gonna knock on wood because I don't wanna jinx us, I don't wanna have a hot summer. Um, it'll probably be earlier. So it'll probably be that second to third week in September. And if the weather is just up and down like it has been in Illinois for the past decade, you know, it'll probably be later. I know there's been years in the past where I've tagged the second week at, or second week of October. Um, but that's usually the time frame that I tag here. So I don't see any more questions. I have one more. Okay. If you know, when I'm growing my milkweed, and you said you don't really need that much, you could even grow it in pots. But if I were going to grow the milkweed, in, in what proximity should I make it to the flowers that the butterflies are going to want to get to when they emerge? Or you know, what is the typical distance? Should they be grown right next to each other? Should they be interspersed? I would say interspersed. That's how I, I did mine. Because when you inter, inter, disperse them, those larvae, remember, can go up to 20 to 30 feet away from their host milkweed plant to find shelter for their chrysalis. So it, it's not something, I mean, there's honeybees out there that can travel miles upon miles to a nectar and pollen source and then still make it back to their hive. Um, so I don't think, think that that's much of a concern. So if you have a large property, but you don't have the space to put both the nectar plants and the host plants in the same area, you can mix it up. It's not gonna hurt anything. Okay, I mean, it, it probably would be very natural that way. What, yeah, what about flocks? Whatever space you have to work with. Lisa, what about using flocks as a, as a plant for the butterflies? You can use phlox. Again, I, I would just suggest going with native, native okay. species of phlox. Or, you know, I know it's hard because the garden centers that are in your community and easy to get to, they're going, they're going to have cultivars and hybrids. And and those are basically bred for bigger blooms and longer lasting blooms, not necessarily the pollen and nectar as a food source for a lot of the insects. Um, so I would recommend, I mean, right now, one of the first nectar sources that is coming out for a lot of our insects is the woodland or wild blue flocks. And we have cleft flocks, smooth flocks. I mean, there's a whole list of flocks here for Illinois. So where can we get that list? So those, one of the apps. Early... So one of the apps that I use on my phone, and it's a free app, is called Illinois Wildflowers. And the key, you can go by plant type. So it gives you wildflower, shrub, conifer. Then you can go by flower color. You can go by petals, how many, size, leaf arrangement, and habitat. Or it has in the search menu, I don't know if you guys can see that. You probably can't see that because it's a glare on my phone. In the search menu, it says show 3,000 plants. So it's given a database of 3,000 species. I just always click on that if I already know the common name or the family and I just type in flocks and it'll okay. bring up the species. And when you click on each species of flocks, it'll give you a map to tell you if that's native, you know, to your county. Um, for instance, you're not gonna wanna plant something that belongs in Southern Illinois on the Missouri or Kentucky border. So the key here is get different types of flowers that for the butterflies that there's some early ones so that they have something right away and then something to cover the rest of the growing season and have the milkweed roughly nearby 
if not interspersed. It, would that get yeah. us all? Through? Yeah, because that milkweed is going to be the host plant. So that's right. going to be needed for the females to lay the eggs and for the eggs to hatch in the larvae to feed and grow. Okay. And we will, um, we will put all of Lisa's uh, references up also so that everyone can refer to them. Go ahead. Oh, you can also do a, a basic Google search for native butterfly plants, like just type in keywords, native butterfly plants, Illinois. And that should pop up various nurseries and plant lists. I know, I, I know the University um, of Illinois Extension website will also have a plethora of material on butterfly gardens and what types of plants to plant as well. Okay, I visit that regularly. I think this is just wonderful. Thank you all for putting your questions up and your comments. Lisa, as always, thank you. And I just wanted to make a commercial here too, since, um, since you're offering to, to uh, do butterfly tagging possibly in the fall, I know you mentioned that if we could get interested parties for a uh, bird hike, birding hike, uh, we might be able to call upon you to host that for us. We have had some interested parties and um, I'm putting out the commercial again now. If, if anyone is interested in attending a bird hike with Lisa, uh, please contact the library, let us know either, Rachel get either an email or message us on Facebook and we are compiling a list. Um, so let us know of your interest. And with well, that, I want to thank everyone again. And Lisa, I'm going to turn it back to you for closing comments. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me again. And we will look forward to your next program. And for tonight, we'll say thank you again and good night. I'll be closing the screen now. Bye, everyone.